Good morning. My name is Andrew Cardoso, and I'm president of the Pearson Center. I will be the moderator and timekeeper today. With that, I'll turn over to Sandra Pucutello, who's the chair of the board of the Pearson Center, and of course, you will know a former economic development minister of Ontario. Sandra. Thank you, Andrew. Welcome, everyone. Is Canada ready to be an isotope superpower? What is the Pearson Center talking about this for? Well, this is a key part of an economic strategy for the country, in our opinion, and we're delighted to bring all kinds of topics to bear, especially as they relate to the social fabric and the economic fabric of the country. So have a look at our, our website if you get a chance to see the over 33 webinars that we've now done since this pandemic started. It's become a platform to give our center much more reach. So today I want to jump right into this next uh, item that we're doing today and talking about isotopes. A special thanks to Bruce Power, our platinum sponsor for today's event. Thank you, James, for managing all of this for us. A special thanks to one of our board members, Patrick Dillon, with the Ontario Building Trades. He's been super to work with, and I can tell you, I can't say no to Patrick. Um, let me briefly introduce our panel, and we're going to jump right in. So let me start with James Skoniak. He's our EVP Vice President, Corporate Affairs and Operational Services from Bruce Power. Thanks, James, for joining. Catherine Heishi, she's with Triumph Innovations, President and CEO, and we're delighted that she's joining us on our panel today. Richard Weens, Director of Strategic Supply and Marketing with Nordian. I can't wait for his commentary. Rebecca Wong, we're delighted to have her joining us from Toronto, who's with Hospital, the Margaret, uh, Princess Margaret Hospital, as well as UHN, the staff radiologist oncologist. Welcome to Dr. Rebecca Wong. And may I turn it over, um, and he's going to come back again towards the end of the session, Paul Lefebvre, which we're delighted to have him joining us, our MP from Sudbury, um, doing a tremendous amount of work for the nuclear industry. So we're going to have him on the panel as well. With that, I want to turn it over to Mike Renchek, who's the president and CEO of Bruce Power. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Sandra. We really appreciate being invited to today's session. You know, this is really an untold story in Canada is that we are an isotope superpower, and we're only going to get larger and better at doing this. Let me give you an example. Uh, right now, Bruce Power produces low specific activity COBOL-60, and we have for a number of years. But with our production, we're able to sterilize about 40% of the once-use medical devices worldwide with these uh, isotopes. And we partner with a company, uh, Nordion, and Richard's here today that'll be talking about that. But our ability to keep doing this, especially during the pandemic, during these times, has meant that people around the world are relying on Canada for isotopes to sterilize items like surgical gloves and swab. All told, our production this year of, of sterilization isotopes has been used to sterilize between 24 and 25 billion pairs of gloves wow. or swabs. We've also moved recently in the last few years into the production of cancer treatments, and we're using isotopes for also sterilizing and protecting uh, food supplies. You know, next year will be a hallmark year for us. We're installing a new production system on one of our reactors that'll enable us to expand our production of isotopes. We'll start to look at isotopes like lutetium-177, which is a leading candidate for prostate cancer treatments and other diagnostic treatments. And with the scale that we're able to master with coming off of our uh, nuclear reactors here at Bruce Power, we'll be able to make isotopes at a scale that have been unprecedented uh, previously. So that means affordable, reliable treatments for people around the world. I'm just happy to be here uh, involved in this today. I think it's a fantastic panel. I think we're on the verge of really breaking out and becoming an economic powerhouse in the area of healthcare through radioisotope treatments. With that, it's my pleasure now to introduce the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources, Paul Lefebvre. Paul? Thank you so much, Mike. It's really a pleasure to be here. Je suis très heureux d'être avec vous. Donc, bonjour tout le monde. Hi, everyone. So, I'm joining you today from my home in Sudbury on the traditional lands of the Atikmishing Anishinaabek. The greater city of Sudbury also includes the traditional lands of the Wanapate First Nations. And I would say in Anishinaabeg is uh, Ani Bojo Kwekwe. 
So I want to begin by thanking the Pearson Center, not only for organizing this webinar, but for all the work that you do as a vital voice for very important issues. Exploring the challenges and opportunities as we work our way to the other side of this pandemic. Today continues that discussion, focusing on isotopes as a key part of our economic recovery. So COVID-19 has reminded us of the importance of Canada's nuclear sector to public health. Like cobalt-60, essential for sterilizing medical equipment and PPE, such as gloves and syringes. Today, a national isotope network stretches across the country with some 26 cyclotrons, nuclear laboratories, research facilities, and three world-class nuclear facilities with reactors producing medical isotopes. I had the pleasure of touring Chalk River just a few months ago and got a first-hand look on the incredible work and research they are doing. All of it positioning Canada as a global leader in isotope production, processing, and innovation. All of it built on Canada's 78-year legacy of nuclear excellence. Today, our country stands among a small elite group of tier one nations that have the full spectrum of nuclear capabilities with world-class nuclear laboratories and scientists, experienced nuclear operators, our own homegrown can-do reactor technology, a strong independent regulator committed to safety and open to innovation in a dynamic nuclear supply chain, supporting $26 billion in refurbishments. The Government of Canada, in partnership with our Crown Corporation, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, has a long history of advancing research and developing medical isotopes. Our recent investment of over $10 million to help build a new nuclear medical hub, the Institute for Advanced Medical Isotopes. Located in Triumph in beautiful British Columbia, this institute will be the first of its kind in Canada and serve as a center for innovative cancer research. Investments such as this position Canada to be among the pioneers in what some have called the third generation of radio pharmaceuticals, with many medical isotope-based therapies being developed and moved to clinical trials. One area of particular promise is the targeted alpha therapies, which allow for treatment to be delivered to particular types of cancer cells in a more focused way, Canadian injury at its finest. In our Canadian expertise at Triumph and Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, are now demonstrating the viability of new processes for one of these targeted alpha therapies, actinium-225, used to treat malignant tumors. OPG, Laurentis Energy Partners, and BWXT are making important progress toward producing molybdenum-99. The medical isotopes supplied by Bruce Power are vital resources to the medical community. All of this bodes well for the future of isotopes in Canada. As vital contributors to public health and the environment, as a dynamic generator of highly skilled jobs, a driver of high-valued exports, and a key contributor to our post-COVID recovery. I am confident the world will continue to look to Canada for isotope produ products and applications. And I look forward to working with all of you as we build that future together. Merci, miigwech. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, uh, Thank you very much, Paul. And, and uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Andrew. I thought I maybe jumped into too quick there. I was turning to you, James. Go ahead, please. Well, that, that's great. Well, well, thanks very much, Paul, for 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 joining us, and and um, uh, we really appreciate not only your role as uh, as parliamentary secretary, but also being the member of parliament for the, the the Sudbury region, where the Northern Ontario School of Medicine just does some of the some really fantastic leading edge work uh, in this space, and we're thrilled to not only have you here today, but but your home community uh, being one of many communities in Canada that is contributing on this front. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, um, uh, to join you today. Uh, I know Andrew's gonna uh, introduce uh, and facilitate a panel discussion, but before I do that, uh, on behalf of the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council, I appreciate the opportunity to give some uh, introductory remarks and really set the stage for the, for the, for the panel discussion. First and foremost, I really want to thank uh, Pat Dillon, Sandra, and Andrew for, for making this happen. I know from, from your perspective with the Pearson Center, this is an, an, an important discussion and an important dialogue. But selfishly, on behalf of the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council, the Pearson Center has links into a lot of people uh, in Ottawa and across Canada who are in really important decision-making roles and people who are gonna be making some decisions as to when we come out of this pandemic and we will come out of this pandemic, what do we focus on and how do we, how do we move Canada forward? 
and our hope is that through today's discussion that we're actually influencing you and giving you some information uh, to consider this as a, as a really strategic priority uh, for Canada. Uh, by way of background, the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council is an organization that has been uh, in existence for a number of years. It has over 60 members. It's not just about nuclear power. It's not just about accelerators. It's not just about uh, researchers. It's about a coalition of these organizations all over Canada who have come together in a unified way to talk about why this is a strategic priority for the world that Canada can lead and have come together and give, given what I would say is a really uh, clear set of recommendations on how we can do that. Frankly, it's one of the few sectors I can see out there in Canada where you have such unity among all of all of the participants in the sector. You know, you're gonna hear from, from Richard Weens, who's gonna talk about sterilization. You're gonna talk about Catherine, who leads an amazing facility in British Columbia and Triumph and an accelerator. Rebecca Wong, who, who's leading work in Theranostics. Uh, and then obviously Mike and others have talked about uh, uh, the role of the nuclear sector. All of these are aligned. We are not in competition with each other. In fact, we're, we're aligned with each other. And if we think about this in its most simple forms, a lot of people say, what the heck is an isotope? And, and the way I think about it is maybe because I'm an electricity person uh, at heart is, I think about isotopes, they are the fuel. They are the electricity that powers modern healthcare. They, po uh, they power modern diagnostic uh, 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 capabilities to diagnose cancer. They power modern treatments uh, to, to uh, fight against cancer, destroy cancer, detect cancer, and, and, and wipe it out. And I know Rebecca is going to talk about that. But it's also a tool in terms of what I would call clean health care. You know, 50 years ago, we lived in a world where people would go into the hospital and there was a greater chance that they would have a secondary infection from a treatment they have in the hospital. And, you know, I went to our local hospital here in Bruce County and said, hey, do you have any expired medical equipment I can use as a prop? So I'm not stealing something from the hospital. And, you know, here's a piece of medical equipment I'm, I'm holding up in my hand right now. If you ask any doctor, you ask any nurse, what's the most important thing in a piece of medical equipment? They'll tell you it's clean and it's sterile. And as Mike Renchek noted, and Richard Weens is going to talk about, in hospitals all over the world, we have sterile medical equipment because of Canadian isotopes. So you don't need a big technical explanation on what an isotope is. An isotope is a source of energy that is used in modern healthcare to diagnose cancer, to treat cancer, and to sterilize medical equipment. And there's, there's other applications, but those are the, the primary ones. The final thing I want to leave people with before we move over to the panel is the Canadian Isotope Council, we have produced a report. It was issued later in, in 2019. Obviously, the pandemic has taken a lot of our attention, but we really in that report, and we'll talk about this in the panel, identified what are the practical things we need to do to be a leader. This is a market that right now is about nine and a half billion dollars uh, as of the start of this year. Uh, in terms of the overall radiopharmaceutical market, that is growing by set to $17 billion by 2023, and it will exponentially grow. Canada has attributes that nobody else has. And when we think about how we're going to build back better from COVID, we have to think about the things that we have that nobody else has, and isotopes is one. The final thing I want to say, and I know I've only got about a minute left, is uh, you know, those are all the positive things. I also want to sort of be very clear, and we have a lot of policymakers on who are very supportive of this discussion, and really identify two gaps and things we need policymakers to help us with. The first thing is, is that there is no one area in the federal government or any level of provincial government who very clearly owns isotopes. There's not a minister of isotopes, and nor do I suggest we create one. But my point being, and, and Mike Grenchek will, will tell you this, when, when you work for a large nuclear company, we have a rule. If there's not one owner in charge of something, that means there's no owner in charge of it. And one of our greatest challenges we have in public policy space is we can go around and talk to 10 ministries, and they all love this. But we really struggle with moving this forward because there's no one cabinet committee, there's no one mind that we can go to to move these public policy items forward. And that also ties in with funding. You know, we don't, we think a lot of the things we're proposing can be done with existing progress programs for the first time in the history of Canada's isotope sector. I really want to recognize Catherine for her leadership role in this. We came together this year and filed a consolidated approach to the federal government through the, uh, uh, the strategic innovation fund. Again, one of the problems we have is there's no one area in government that can help us advocate for this. Everybody agrees with their 5% of it. 
And now while that may add up to 150%, we don't know who our champion is. And so, you know, very selfishly, we need help of groups like the Pearson Center. We need help of policymakers to move this forward. We have all of the pieces. Uh, this is not a major financial ask. It's hugely strategic. But this is what part of the reason why we're selfishly doing this. We have the technology, we have the people, we have the capability, but we do not have the public policy framework in Canada to seize this opportunity. And so that's the gap. And, and that's where we need to turn, um, uh, you know, positive sentiments into action. So, Andrew, I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. I want to thank you. I also want to recognize Andrew Teal, who has worked with you to put this together. Andrew always does a magnificent job. And I'll tell you, as a Canadian, this is something we can lead. And, you know, I have behind me a picture of the, I'm, I'm, uh, the man on the moon. Uh, and, and, you know, when, when you talk to people around the world, they say, when they think of the space program, what's the first thing they say about Canada? They talk about the Canada arm. And we need to find areas as a country that we can be the best at. You know, we don't have, we're not a very big country. We're not a very big economy. We're only 36 million people. But if we pick our spots and we do them well, we can be a leader. And if we do this right, when the president of the United States, when the G20 gets together and they talk about fighting cancer, what are they gonna say? Well, the Canada arm for fighting cancer is providing a reliable supply of isotopes that Canada can lead. That's where we can punch above our weight. So as you're thinking about this debate, I'd ask you to think about it in those terms. We're not, you know, we have a lot of great things in Canada, but we're not big. So we really have to pick our spots and we pick our spots. We got to knock it out of the park. So back over to you, Andrew, and I'm really excited uh, about the discussion we're going to have. And I want to thank Catherine, Rebecca, Richard for, for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, uh, James, for that introduction to, to isotopes and the council. Um, this is a, a really exciting time to be talking about isotopes as, as a new technology that, that can really be helping uh, Canadians and helping people the world over, and, and congratulations for all the work you're doing. Um, our audience today is, is quite wide. There are people who have, ex have a lot of experience, who are experts in this field, as well as a lot of people who are not. Uh, who have an interest in, in industrial policy, health policy at large. And so as we go through, I may ask you at times to explain a few terms uh, here and there, and I'll actually explain a little bit more about what you do. So my first question is about the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council that, that you have all formed. Um, and I'll ask um, uh, Catherine and James to talk a little bit about it um, and talk about why it's important uh, but before we do that, Catherine, can you just tell us a little bit more about what you do? You're based in Vancouver. Uh, you're noted as Canada's Particle Accelerator Center. Can you talk a little bit about what you do and how it relates to this new council? Sure. So Triumph is Canada's Particle Accelerator Center. So we um, have been around for more than 50 years. The Prime Minister came to our 50-year anniversary uh, last year and um, celebrated with us. Uh, and we have the world's largest cyclotron of its kind. So we are really a, a significant player on the global scene in our space. Um, I, I think James makes an excellent point that there really aren't that many things um, in Canada that we can say this is really among the best in the world. And, and Triumph, I'm very proud to say, is, is, is one of those things. I really believe that. Um, so we have uh, about 500 uh, scientists, technicians, students on staff. Uh, a lot of what Triumph does is tackle things like um, they work on the Higgs boson project, they look for the missing dark matter in the universe, but we also use the cyclotron to make medical isotopes. Um, and uh, we've been doing that for over 40 years. We uh, spent many of those years partnering with uh, Nordian and, uh, and now we're partnering with PWXT to um, get those isotopes into the hands of uh, clinicians and patients around the world. So we produced over 60 million doses of isotopes over the years in, in partnership with our, our private sector partners. And Triumph Innovations is really um, the piece that tries to find industry opportunities and partnerships, commercialization. So we're there to be the business facing side of Triumph. Um, this new era of radio uh, diagnostics and radio therapeutics is very exciting to us. And that's really one of the main uh, drivers of you know, in order to push those technologies forward, in order to advance them in a timely way so that we can really be leaders, we have to work together and we have to find a way to collaborate. We have to find a way to share our resources and the CNIC and, you know, and now this new ecosystem 
funding project that we uh, have been working on for several months now um, is, is part of that story. So I really want to thank James. Um, you know, he made a trip out to, to Triumph with, uh, with Andrew and we talked a lot about these sort of visions and dreams and a, a lot of it has come true. We've made a ton of progress in the past couple of years uh, and we're excited to, for the future. Great, thanks. And James, why would people want to join uh, CNIC? Well, the first thing, it's free, Andrew, and free is always a good price. Um, but, but aside from that, I mean, at the end of the day, I think one of the challenges we all we have in, you know, these are very technical fields. If you go and look at what Catherine's doing and you got to go out there to BC and C, or you go to a nuclear plant or you listen to Rebecca Wong or, or Richard, they're very technical streams. And I think sometimes one of the problems we have, Andrew, is we, we sometimes uh, are into so much of this technical detail and so much of this innovation that we really fail to put together a very strong, compelling public policy narrative on how we move all of these amazing things together. So for us, Andrew, it's really about, um, you know, uh, joining an organization that has a very positive, aspirational view of an area that Canada can lead in. Right. And, you know, if you think about it just personally, Andrew, I bet you there's nobody that has joined uh, your session today who has not been touched by isotopes in a very personal way. If you've ever gone in on a medical procedure, you've relied on sterilization of medical equipment. Uh, all of us have been impacted by cancer, whether it's a family member, a friend, a loved one, maybe you yourself. And these are core things to a modern health, global healthcare system we need. And, and I think any Canadian who believes that, that, that Canada needs to step up in, in, in a number of these areas that are very strategic as a candidate and lead the world, if you're a Canadian and you believe that, you know, the, the topic of this is Canada isotope superpower with a question mark. Our collective hope is through the work of the CNIC is to turn that question mark into an exclamation mark. You know, there should be no question that we are an isotope superpower. We have things and assets and capability that nobody else has. So if you're a Canadian and you care about fighting cancer and you care about leading global healthcare, uh, you've got a bunch of friends in the CNIC. Uh, and so, um, you know, it's really about packaging a lot of that great work that is done and making sure it doesn't get lost. Uh, thank you. And uh, Catherine, I'll just ask you to add if you have any comments in terms of, of the superpower issue. And, and I should tell you when, when putting this session together, Sometimes we obsess over over some of the punctuation, but uh, interesting, James should mention that we did obsess over whether we would have an exclamation mark or question mark. And so the challenge is really to you all today to to make the case um, right. that we are or are becoming an isotope superpower. Uh, Catherine, what's, what are your thoughts on that? I think that we have, and and you know, this is really the the federal government that has put. Um, over the years, significant investments into building reactors, into building cyclotrons. So we have this infrastructure and we have um, a society and a culture where we can use those um, to collaborate and to mobilize those technologies and the intellectual property behind them. I, I mean, one of the big advantages that every time I talk to somebody from the United States um, tells me rather jealously is that um, because our infrastructure operates outside of a military structure like the Department of Energy. Um, we have an enormous advantage in that we can be more nimble, we can be more flexible, we can be more collaborative, um, and we can work together to, um, to advance things more quickly. I mean, there are literally billions of dollars being put to work in the United States, um, but we often make progress faster than they do because we have a more a uh, nimble, collaborative way of working in Canada. And, uh, and I do agree that um, if we act quickly and if we act together, we can get ahead of the world in things like actinium and lutetium and gallium production. These are isotopes of the future um, that we are seeing <clears throat> incredibly promising results in. And you know, if, if we get our act together now, uh, we, we can be a, a global leader and I and I you know I'm I'm a Canadian and I actually I had a discussion with my husband last night and uh, and I said where do you think Canada is a global superpower and like honestly and, and he's like hockey and I mean I think that there's you know something is, is true about that I mean uh, we are a small nation you know we have to pick 
areas where we can punch above our weight. And, you know, I, I thought again of the Olympics um, scenario where we said, well, we're going to own the podium. So that means we have to try to focus our resources and actually support the people that we think are gold medal hopefuls or, or medalist hopefuls. And I feel like radioisotopes is an area like that for Canada. If we focus and actively um, accelerate and support this area, we can lead. Um, we're not there yet, but we have the potential. We have already the investments in reactors and cyclotron infrastructure. It's just a matter of leveraging those and working together. Okay, thanks. I'd like to carry on this discussion, but I do want to uh, get some more questions in, if you don't mind. Um, I want to talk about isotopes in healthcare and, and, and have a bit more of a detailed discussion. So uh, to Dr. Rebecca Wong and Richard Weens, uh, Dr. Wong, you're an epidemiologist. You're leading specializing. You're, you're leading specialist in the field of cancer care, and uh, you're a radiation oncologist. Uh, tell us a little bit about how uh, how isotopes are used in healthcare, um, either in general or in any relation to um, to COVID. Um, so I'm an oncologist, and I treat cancers. Um, most of the time, I use radiation with external beam. However, um, the use of radioisotopes uh, for treating cancers is a field that I've been working on for the last uh, five or six years, and I'll tell you a bit more about it. And this is a field that I will refer to as molecular, uh, um, molecular oncology or theranostics. Um, and is the use of um, open source radioisotopes in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. Um, the, the, and this is a field that is going to really explode in the next five or 10 years. Um, it's estimated that um, uh, by 2025, um, the, the market in uh, nuclear medicine will be about $12 billion in the US, and most of it is because of this growth in theranostics. What it is, is that, um, I mean, as you um, may have uh, heard and, and be familiar with, in cancer, a breast cancer um, in, in this patient is not the same as the other patient. Within one category of cancer, there are many different subtypes. And we are beginning to learn that uh, based on the molecular characteristics of these cancer cells, they behave differently and we can treat them differently. Um, and that's what molecular oncology does. It allows, it, uh, we, we identify these cellular markers and by using radioisotopes, we're able to detect them and we're able to detect the variability in the patient. Um, and um, with that information, we are able to uh, direct our radiotherapy, chemotherapy, but more importantly, designing theranostics using the radioisotope, a different type of radioisotope, not only to see, but to actually attack the cancer cells. So it's a keyhole and key phenomenon. We inject the radio pharmaceutical, the, the, the drug can find these cancer cells themselves, um, and the rest is not needed, it's excreted, and is a really exciting um, um, uh, uh, modality that we expect to become a standard modality complementing the existing tools of surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy that we use daily every day. Um, so um, just a little bit uh, as to how my, my involvement is really bringing lutetium 177 dotatate therapy into Ontario for treatment of neuroendocrine patients. Um, uh, it did not exist five years ago, and now it's becoming, uh, evolving to become standard practice. Um, so that's, uh, that's one aspect of it. But of course, um, it's not only used in treating cancer, um, it is also used in diagnosis. So bone scans, um, uh, scans to look for clots, um, to look at lung function, those are routine tests that we use. But more excitingly, um, there are uh, investigations, uh, promising research going into uh, diagnosing Alzheimer's disease, diagnosing Parkinson's disease, and uh, identifying uh, better treatments for them. So lots of opportunities. Yeah, it's quite, quite amazing, Dr. Wong. Thank you. Uh, Richard Weens, your, your, your comments too, and I, I wonder if you could also, um, you, uh, your company, Nordian, is a leading global provider of Cobalt-60. Uh, can you just tell us how Cobalt-60 is produced and what it's used for? Sure. I get the first comment I'll make um, back to your, your original question or the, the premise of the webinar about whether uh, Canada is an isotope superpower 
is I, I would argue that not to take the foot off the gas of owning the podium, but that it already is um, because we're, we're I, I characterize the whole industry as kind of small but global, if that makes any sense. And, um, you know, so we, we travel in pretty broad geographic circles and every experience I've had, including those in countries that have very well developed nuclear infrastructures and expertise in things like isotopes, uh, it's, it's unbelievable the reaction that you get when they find out you're from Canada. Um, their eyes light up because we're, we're, we have such a reputation uh, as, as kind of owning this space um, from, a, from an R&D standpoint and from a, a delivery standpoint and from a, um, a clinician standpoint and all of these things, right? So uh, that, that's been my experience in terms of where Canada, how, how the rest of the world sees Canada. Um, but now, now I'll answer your actual question. Um, so Nordion produces cobalt 60 for fundamentally two things, and, uh, and we've talked a little bit about both of them. One of them uh, is for sterilization of single-use medical devices. So James uh, talked about syringes and gloves and their catheters and orthopedic implants. And uh, again, back to this idea that 40% of all single-use medical devices around the world are sterilized with, with gamma, with cobalt-60. Uh, and about 50% of that cobalt-60 comes from the, from the province of Ontario. So uh, Ontario and Canada is a huge contributor to global health care. You can walk into a clinical setting just about anywhere, well, literally anywhere in the world, uh, and look around, and one out of two of, uh, of those single-use medical devices will have been sterilized with cobalt-60. And it is uh, um, so it, it's it's really prevalent. It's been uh, it's been used for more than 50 years for this application. Uh, it's it's well known. It's safe. It's reliable. Um, it's secure. Uh, and it really it really is a contribution that most people don't know uh, that Canada is making to, to global health care. So I think uh, back to the very first question about why would people join um, the CNIC, I think a, a big part of it for us is awareness, right? So the number of people who don't know this story um, and, and getting that message out. Um, Cobalt-60 in terms of its production is made in, in power reactors. It's a relatively simple process. We have awesome infrastructure. Can-do uh, reactors happen to be the best in the world uh, at making Cobalt-60 and isotopes in general, uh, just because of the, uh, the nature of the design and the, and the physics that, that happen in those reactors. But we take a naturally occurring cobalt-59 uh, and we put it in a, in a reactor and uh, it sucks up neutrons as part of the regular nuclear reaction that, that produces power primarily. Uh, and we take it out after an operating cycle, so two or three years, uh, and that's the cobalt-60 that's uh, that used for these applications. So I mentioned, uh, I mentioned sterilization, single-use medical devices, uh, again, to, to uh, Dr. Wong's uh, um, what you talked about there. We also use uh, high specific activity cobalt, um, same same cobalt in a slightly different form with slightly different characteristics for treatment of cancer. So external beam therapy uh, for treatment of cancer in a couple of different ways. So and, and and just briefly, Richard, how does that sterilization take place? What is the equipment that's that's used? Sure. Sure. So, so we would take that cobalt. Uh, so Bruce, th this just happened. So Bruce Power just finished a campaign uh, where they had shut down the reactor for a, a maintenance outage. They removed the cobalt 60. They shipped it to us. Uh, we produced uh, something called a sealed source, um, which looks like a pencil that's about 18 inches long and a half an inch in diameter. And we shipped that to customers. We shipped about 40 countries around the world. Uh, the, the infrastructure for sterilizing is about 250 of these very large scale facilities. Um, so imagine a big concrete bunker um, with some, some machinery inside it and the radiation source sits inside that uh, and the product is put into uh, metal tote boxes and passed into a biological shield um, and it circulates around this radiation source and the energy, the gamma, uh, the gamma energy that comes from the decay of the cobalt-60 uh, as James alluded to, it's just an energy source, right? It's like uh, it's like boiling water on your stove. Um, it imparts energy into the material uh, and fundamentally disrupts the DNA of the microorganisms that you're worried about so that they can't reproduce uh, and, and renders it um, effectively sterile. Product comes out the other end and it goes off to the hospital. One of the, one of the nice things about uh, 
the, this modality for sterilization is you can um, you can sterilize stuff in the finished packaging, right? So a big cardboard box full of um, of sub cartons, full of band aids or uh, or uh, COVID swabs or any of that kind of stuff. So really effective, fast, um, and uh, and reliable. Okay, thanks. Uh, my next question is for James and, and Dr. Wong, and it's around the um, the security of of production. So um, I, I think of I think James, as as you mentioned, cancer touches us all. So I think everybody who 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 is as touched would have some support, sympathy for the issue for the production use of, of isotopes. But we know there's also a historic um, opposition to new, to the nuclear industry, the new nuclear production of power. Um, and the other part is is the safe transportation of isotopes. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about that. And what, what's your response to people who are opposed to nuclear energy and, and the production of isotopes? Right. Um, so so a couple of good couple of good questions. Uh, so so maybe I'll start with uh, with the issue around reliability of supply. So if you think about this from an electricity generation perspective, and, and nuclear reactors are not the only source of isotopes. There's there's accelerators like like Catherine's facility. But what's really important is um, we're not competing with each other. There's certain isotopes reactors can produce, like the cobalt-60 Richard's talking about, and there's certain isotopes like actinium that Catherine talked about that accelerators do. So we need both. I think that's first and foremost. The second thing I would say is global healthcare has built on a very weak foundation when it comes to isotope supply. So for, for decades and decades, we relied on places like Chalk River, which was one single research reactor, so when that reactor has to go out on maintenance, like your car needs to go off on maintenance, supply is interrupted. And so what we're doing here in Canada is a game changer. We have multiple can-do reactors that are redundant, just like electricity supply. If one reactor is off on maintenance, we have other reactors running. So, so what we're doing here in Canada is a game changer in terms of redundancy, on the, both on the reactor side between Bruce Power and OPG, and also with what Catherine's talked about with the expansion of, of accelerators. You know, I'm going to I'm going to say something that, that that will sound a little bit. I hope it doesn't come across as arrogant, but I, you know, uh, you know, I've spent my whole career in, in nuclear. My dad worked at this site. I've come from a ta small town that that this facility is hosted in is. And sometimes when you work in the nuclear industry, you feel like you're asked to pay for the wedding, but not invited to the party. And, and, and I, I, you know, that's the most honest way I can answer your question. So, so here, here's what I, for people that, that are opposed to nuclear power is, is what I say is, do you care about climate change? Yes or no? Because part of the reason why we are making no progress on climate change globally is because we are not embracing all of those, all of the solutions to fight climate change. We are losing the fight against climate change in the world. And the only one jurisdiction in the world who has made a very material move in the fight against climate change over the last 15 years was the province of Ontario through the phase out of coal. 70% of the electricity needed to phase out coal in Ontario came from nuclear. So if, if people believe climate change is an existential threat, why would you not use the most powerful energy source known to man that does not emit greenhouse gas emissions to fight it? Are there challenges with nuclear power? Of course there are but we've proven we can manage those, but we need to get out of fiction and move into fact. And I don't know what to say to somebody that says, we don't wanna fight cancer. You know, I remember the day in June of 2009 when my dad was diagnosed with cancer. The only thing I care about is that he gets the best treatment. And right now we are on a collision course globally where there are people who are gonna get that bad cancer news and it's not going to be that we don't have treatments. It's going to be we don't have supply of isotopes. So, yeah, and unfortunately, you know, cancer. I don't know what else to say to that, Andrew. Yeah, and for, and unfortunately, cancer rates are growing uh, worldwide too. Well, and and look, we want countries, developing countries, to to prosper and grow their middle class and move out of poverty. And as people. Uh, those economies grow and, and those folks have access to some of the things that we're, we're very, as Canadians, fortunate to have in our healthcare system, they're gonna want access to diagnostic treat, diagnostics. They're gonna want access to cancer treatments and we want them to, but we are gonna start to have, you know, the prime minister has talked a lot about making sure everybody around the world has access to, to vaccines, not just rich countries. Well, the same is exactly the case with isotopes. We are gonna start to have have and have not countries unless we, 
secure this global supply. And I think the work at Triumph, the work across Canada, we can be a world leader in securing that supply. So I'm not fussed about the nuclear d debate. I, I think people need to get over it. Again, if they want us to pay for the wedding, we're going to have to be invited to the party. Thanks, uh, James. Dr. Long, your thoughts? Um, perhaps I can talk about the safety issue at the clinical interface. Yeah. Um, and I, I think we take, as, as a healthcare worker, we take great pride in the safety culture um, that is being refined and um, uh, improved upon on a yearly basis as we uh, build the redundancy um, to cross check and double check to make sure um, the treatment that we are getting to our patient is safe. Um, we have very robust systems in terms of identifying errors and investigating them um, and uh, putting in place solutions. Um, and I think that um, despite the fact that um, we are not the richest country, but we do, we do have some resources that uh, adequate resource and good amount of resources being dedicated to ensure safety. Um, and uh, I think uh, all the departments um, that uh, provide the healthcare um, embraces that, that culture um, and is very inherent in our system. Talking about um, radio pharmaceuticals, um, the, um, the, there's government regulations, there's radiation safety, there's hospital um, safety, um, and uh, we we um, dot the i's, cross the t's at every level uh, as the it leads the hospital door to the van. There is some sign off, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, and I think um, that I. The, the system is really quite robust and with a lot of redundancy to ensure the safety. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, James, I want to ask you about the, the federal budget. So the federal budget, uh, we, we had an economic statement uh, this week uh, federally, but the federal budget will be likely in March or so. What would be your one ask uh, for the industry? Yeah, I mean, I, um, you know, at the end of the day, the, the federal budget continued to uh, fund the strategic innovation fund uh, that that fund continues and um, we have a proposal into the strategic innovation fund that needs to get approved and um, and you know what I we always remind people who are public policy makers and look they have really tough jobs right now I'm not you know I mean I can't imagine what some of these these our leaders in Ottawa are dealing with with priorities but the decisions they make now on these things are going to determine what we can do in eight, nine months when they're going to want to see the result. And so my ask would be two things, Andrew. The first is thank you for continuing to fund the Strategic Innovation Fund. I think it's been great for Canada, and we, but, but we have an application, and that application needs to get approved tomorrow or in the near future. But more importantly is when we think of these things, let's not start having these conversations in July of 2021 when we start to think we're putting COVID behind us. The decisions we make now will determine where we are then. If we start those discussions then, we've just lost eight months. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and that's tough because look, our, I can't imagine what the deputy prime minister is waking up and dealing with every morning, right? Uh, but we have to find a way as we're thinking ahead to COVID is how do we start getting out of the urgent? We need to deal with the urgent, but how do we start making some of these calls now? Because as you know, Andrew, there's always a lead time on these things. Yeah, and it, it strikes me it's, it's an interesting timing issue because on the one hand, isotopes are very much part of the solution to our huge healthcare problem, that crisis, and at the same time, you're offering the ability to grow a sector and grow jobs. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, when we look at, you know, I mean, one of the challenges I think the federal government has is that everybody's coming to them with ideas on what the recovery looks like. And I think they add all of those things up and they say, hey, this is hundreds and hundreds of billions. We can't do it all. So that's really, I think Catherine, Catherine's analogy on owning the podium, I think was a great one. We got to pick our areas, but also we not only need to pick our areas, we need to pick areas where we look at the quantum of investment required versus the return. And, you know, when we're talking about isotope, you know, we're not talking hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars here. We're not talking billions of dollars. We're literally talking millions and tens of millions, right? We're, we're so so. I think that's another thing is you know 
sometimes one of the things I, I hate to say this when we go and talk to people in government I think we would have a better time if we were going and asking for a billion dollars because sometimes when you go as an industry and say hey we're looking for a 45 million dollar targeted investment people think well I can't be that big of a deal for Canada 40 million dollars geez people don't get out of bed for 40 million dollars in the Ministry of Finance right now so so that's a bit of a challenge for us as well Andrew and frankly you know, all cards on the table. That's why we we really appreciate the Pearson Center doing this because I think the profile of this will really help with that dialogue. Well, well, thank you. Let me let me just um, we we have we're, the clock is running fast because all of you have so much interesting stuff to say. But let me come to a closing question that I'll pose to all of you. Um, talk to us about where you see the sector over the next five to ten years. Where's the growth? And um, you've laid out a, a lot of the issues, but if you can encapsulate again um, where you see the growth and, and, and what is the excitement that we should be feeling about, about this industry. Um, and I'll start with uh, Catherine Hayashi, please. Uh, so certainly at, at Triumph, uh, we are very interested in a medical isotope called Actinium-225, and it's one that we've seen show remarkable um, efficacy in fighting late-stage metastasized cancer. So patients that have failed chemotherapy, failed conventional radiotherapy, and would have you know, typically three to six months left to live, and the cancer spread from their prostate to their rib cage, to their shoulders, to you know, all, all of their major organs, we're seeing those some of those patients um, reach a remission state with actinium-225 treatment, which is remarkable. Um, but I think you know, as, as we were talking about before in terms of supply chain, one of the main problems with that therapy is that there's only enough actinium for a few thousand patients in the whole world right now. And so we are trying to scale up um, to provide tens of thousands of doses of that um, for Canadians and for the world. And, and you know, it, it's, it's very topical. The, the talk we're hearing about vaccines is like, well, who gets a vaccine first? You know, who gets prioritized? We literally have even today, before we have actually um, done the scale up project, we get people phoning every month from all around the world saying, we hear you have actinium, you know, we want some, um, we'll pay you up front, name your price. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I, I think that this is, uh, I, you know, when venture capital fund investors from the United States are calling, a, calling you up and asking you about when you're going to have actinium available, I mean, this is uh, an area with incredibly high potential, both economically, also to benefit the health of Canadians and, you know, and of course, we're a national lab. We, we do feel that Canadians are our priority and Canadian partners are our priority. So we're kind of poised to, to go, um, but we definitely need support. Um, you know, one of the things that James um, didn't mention about this, the Strategic Innovation Fund was our original ask was 70 million for the fund. And then they told us that we could um, apply for 30. So, which is great. Uh, we're, we are definitely going to push forward with that, but now I got to go find the rest of the money somewhere. Um, so, you know, sort of like on the podium, like we're all working like three part-time jobs to scrape up enough money to, to do our projects. Um, so having a more concentrated, focused, active support uh, would be a, a game changer for us. But I, I just believe that there is so much promise in this area for, for us and for Canada. Yeah, there's talk of three part-time jobs. I mean, really, you folks are visionaries, aren't you? I mean, it's it's fun. It's really fun to watch this. Oh, it's so. it's incredibly exciting. The the scientists that we and the engineers that we work with at Triumph are remarkable. Uh, Richard Weens, your thoughts about where we where we need to go in the next few years? Sure. Well, you know, the first thing I would say is we've we've got a back back to the point I made earlier. We've got a leadership position, a strong leadership position, uh, particularly when it comes to the supply of cobalt sixty to the world, uh, and we need to maintain that. And that means we need to, in order for the modality to be viable in the long term, we need to make more cobalt. Um, so we have some we have projects uh, with both Bruce and and OPG at OPG's Darlington site. Um, to, to look at producing cobalt there. Uh, and they're uh, there, by the way, also uh, in a project with BWXD to produce Molly at the Darlington site. So, um, um, and we also have a project with Bruce Power to figure out how we can make more cobalt in the reactors that they're already making cobalt in. So 
Uh, Bruce is actually, uh, beyond Bruce Power being the largest operating uh, nuclear power facility in the world, they're the largest provider of cobalt-60. Uh, but of course, we're never satisfied with that. So we've, uh, we've asked them to figure out how they can make more in the, in the Bruce B reactors. Uh, and that's, that's really what the focus is going to be on, is leveraging that existing uh, infrastructure uh, that we've made these big investments in and continue to make big investments in. Um, so that we have a supply of isotopes, uh, because that's what the industry worries about, right? Is is there going to be enough of this stuff uh, in 10 years, and 20 years, and 30 years? Uh, and, and we can say with confidence uh, that with partners like Bruce, that 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 will be the case. Uh, the second thing I'll point to in the other application area is sort of the evolution of um, stereotactic radio surgery, which is a broad set of applications for high specific activity cobalt. Um, uh, the gamma knife is something people may have heard about. That's, uh, that's a, a trade name associated with particular SRS. Uh, there's also some emerging technology that uses the same kind of principle that the gamma knife uses to treat brain cancer for early stage breast cancer. It's called the gamma pod. Um, and that is, that's kind of an up and coming, uh, up and coming technology. There are other variants of the gamma knife that are being produced by, by other folks. Uh, so some some very exciting uh, developments there. And again, we're in the unique um, the, the unique position to be able to supply enough high specific activity cobalt uh, for for all of the global needs, frankly, for those for those applications. Yeah, and and Richard, who are the which are the other countries that are competitors with us in this in the field of isotopes? Well, so there's really five countries from a cobalt perspective that produce that produce cobalt, right? There's Canada is the leader, uh, Russia, Argentina, China, and India. Um, so all all of the things that we do in Canada, uh, more or less, the, the other countries do as well, and they're and they're good at it, but they don't have the uh, again, they don't have the kind of the oomph that we have in terms of the, the capability and the capacity. Uh, and the other thing I would just point out quickly is that producing an isotope is one thing, right? Not, not that it's easy, but producing an isotope is one thing. Getting it to the end user or the patient or whoever actually needs to use it is an entirely different thing. And it's a set of skills that people kind of forget about sometimes. And we have it in spades in Canada. Uh, because we've been doing it for so long. So to figure out how to get an isotope that's got a 66 hour half-life. So in less than three days, it's going to be kind of worth half as much as it is now. H how you get that around the globe to a patient, um, you know, that's a that's a non-trivial exercise, uh, okay. but again, it's something that we're experts at. Okay, sorry to, sorry to move along, but thanks for that answer and also a better understanding of, of the global um, nature of this industry. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Wong and then James Skaniak on the question of the next uh, uh, five to ten years. So um, I think uh, the, the come back to the issue of molecular uh, oncology that I think will really uh, uh, grow in the next five to ten years. Um, in order, it, and it's not just the ones that we recognize right now, such as lutetium, actinium, um, uh, and, and treatment of prostate cancer, and et cetera. I think um, it opens a lot of doors for treating other types of cancers. And we're imagining that diagnostic centers will, um, centers of excellence will uh, be formed across the country um, that will take um, design, identifying these markers, designing uh, novel radiopharmaceuticals, and then testing it in a clinical setting and bringing it to patients. Um, we envisage that actually most of the interventions right now with um, molecular oncology is for patients with metastatic disease. Um, but it's easy to imagine that when we are, have identified those tools, we can bring it earlier in the disease trajectory and use it to treat patients who have high risk of having metastatic disease and, come, and be able to cure more patients um, that are destined to fail uh, and develop metastatic disease. Uh, that's uh, okay. very much in our foreseeable rea reality. Thank you, James. And then we'll have a last word from Paul Lafayette. Yeah, I know we're short on time, so I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet. So, so diagnostic, Canada is going to be a world leading supplier between what Richard talked about at OPG, some of the work we're doing at Bruce in terms of a reliable supply of isotopes for diagnostics, number one. In terms of treatment, the work that Catherine's doing, Bruce is doing, 
again, we can be that global supplier. The projects are underway, the expertise is there. Sterilization, couldn't agree with Richard Moore. OPG is that project at Darlington. It's a great project to start producing cobalt 60 there. And we're looking at everything we can do here at Bruce to, to do more to optimize that. So, you know, right out of the gate, that is crit. The world is counting on us to get those three things right. And the fourth thing is, and not to put, I, look, I couldn't, I really appreciate Paul's support. You know, but when we think of this from a, you know, I would like a, a motion introduced in the House of Commons that declares this a strategic sector for Canada. Uh, I think we can get all parties to support it. I don't know who the heck would disagree with this. And while you may say, hey, what is the, you know, that doesn't cost us anything, but it sends a message to the world, to all the customers that we're dealing with, that Canada treats us as a priority. And, you know, I, I, I just, I say that as something that would be easy to do, substantive, but it really starts to change the dynamic in all of these conversations. And so that fourth thing, that's something I'd like to see before the end of January of 2021, but we'll take it within the next five years. <laughs> okay, with that, I'll, I'll turn to Paul Lefebvre, who's the uh, Parliamentary Secretary for Natural Resources. Paul, you've had a chance to listen, you joined us for the last hour, heard a lot of great ideas. Uh, your, your closing comments uh, and what you'll take back to to the government. Well, certainly, I want to thank all the panelists, uh, obviously, and yourself, Andrew, and, and the Pearson Institute, uh, Catherine, Rebecca, Richard, James. This has been fascinating. Obviously, uh, we, you know what? I think the, the main takeaway here is that certainly what, what, what was said will obviously bring back to, to the Department of Natural Resources. But uh, certainly uh, the fact that the importance of the sector and that's and so how much little is known in the general population. Right of what's going on, and I'll be honest. Certainly, we talk about how this sector affects us personally. Well, my dad had cancer, right? I'm sure he was uh, the reason why he's still with us today is because we had the isotopes and the and the way that we were able to help him, as well as my wife is is a dermatologist, so she uses sterile equipment on a daily basis, right? So again, it, it affects our lives, but people don't know that because that where the source is from nuclear. So again, I want to thank the panelists and maybe a shout out to Bruce Power as well for 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 doing what what you do with respect to, to, to cobalt. But my, so some of the takeaways here is certainly how do we leverage the existing infrastructure? It was said by Richard and Catherine certainly we are a global superpower, but how do we make sure that we maintain the podium and we actually own it more, more than just like let, let's get on it? We are there, but how do we make sure that we maintain the podium? And I think what the suggestion that James brought forward and all of the panelists have, have brought forward saying these are the measures that we can do to really just leverage what we're already doing and we're so and, and to, to to continue. As we said, certainly the supply of the isotope is key. If we don't continue the supply, now the certainty of supply, they'll go see something else in, in for some other, and that's just how science works. So I really wanted to, uh, again, it's uh, it's been a fascinating discussions uh, that I've heard, and certainly James, we can touch base on a later basis, more than happy to continue the advocacy because of this important sector is so key. So again, thank you everyone. It's been really, really great to hear from you. Merci. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you, everybody. At the Pearson Center, this is really an exciting session for us to have on two fronts. One is the enormous healthcare uh, implications that we've talked about and, and the incredible uh, economic growth implications. So thank you for bringing that to us. I just want to tell our viewers quickly, we've got uh, two webinars coming up next week. On, on December 9th, we have a session with Peter Mansbridge. He'll be talking about his new book, Extraordinary Canadians. And on December 10th, We'll be having a session on polarization with uh, uh, Professor Justin Guest from the United States and former Premier Dalton McGuinty. So thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, all the best and stay well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.